Hello everybody, here we are and we are going to be doing a recap of week 7 in the CFL. Now before we start, please make sure to subscribe if you're new to me or the channel. That being said, let's get on into it. So the first game of the week were the Edmonton Elks against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at Winnipeg. This was going to be a tall task for Edmonton to pick up their first win of the season. And it gets a little worse as Kenny Lawler, former Edmonton Elk that played with him last year, was set to make his season debut. Ended up, you know, doing pretty well for himself. Had 93 yards. And it was Winnipeg who scored first in this one thanks to a rushing touchdown by Dakota Prukup in the first half. I think it might have been the first quarter. Uh, Taylor Cornelius early on looked pretty good. Had a lot of good mobility. Finished with like 50 plus yards rushing in this game. Might have even been in the first half. I think that was on 3 down Nation. But notably he had two big runs that allowed them to get into the 25 in this first half. Unfortunately though they end up getting just one or two field goals out of it. And at halftime shockingly thanks to a missed PAT by Winnipeg it is 6-6. Six to six. Luckily for the 28 plus thousand in attendance they feel a little bit better after Nick Dembski ends up getting a deep ball thrown to him. Ends up being a touchdown for Winnipeg as they start to get a little bit of momentum going. Unfortunately though, Dylan Mitchell cooks to Mario Houston on a slow go route. Goes to the inside, cuts back out. Ends up taking it for something like 80 yards. I can't remember how many yards it was, but that was his first touchdown of the year. And it was great for Edmonton to get a little bit of life. A little bit later on though, Taylor Cornelius basically ends up taking the safety after a turnover on down situation. Third down, so now it's 18-14 to 14 Winnipeg. And from there, it would be Rashid Bailey that a little bit later scores for the Blue Bombers who end up making this one a good game in the sense that they get the W 28 to 14 not the onslaught that I thought it would be overall though I think Edmonton didn't take advantage of some good field position to score and Winnipeg receivers did what seems to kind of be the trend for them they know where to settle in defenses and especially if it's zone coverage they really do seem to find a great spot or if the play breaks down they know where to kind of settle so that was good for them Dalton Schoen did get hurt and this one had to leave I think he's going to be all right basically in an interview he said you know I feel all right I think I'll be okay and as far as I know he's not set to miss time for Winnipeg they end up bouncing back after a hard loss to Ottawa moving to 5-2 and two on the year Edmonton now 0-7 after taking a 14 point loss in Manitoba then we had the second game of the week, which was the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Toronto Argonauts, Toronto traveling to Hamilton, looking to move to 5-0 for the first time to start a season since 1960, just the third year in CFL uh, history or existence. And this game was wild early as you had Dejon Brissett end up getting a big 50-yard pass from Chad Kelly to open this one up 7-0. Then a little bit later, you would see Chad Kelly and Coke continuing to hum along in a drive, and it was Curly Gittins Jr. who got a pretty easy score. A good throw by Kelly. He ended up coming down with it. It's now 14 to nothing. And you would see Jamal Peters, a guy that of course has been so good for them, especially last year. This year came back after a stint in the NFL. He ends up getting what would be a pick six, gets called back, but they still have the interception. Um, and then not too long after that one, you would see DeVaris Daniels get a major and it's 20 to nothing. I did want to add it was actually Cam Dukes that had that rushing touchdown, not Dejon Percet for the first one, but still it's 21 to nothing. Things are not going well for this team at being the Tiger Cats, but luckily for them, they do get a big return by Tyreek McAllister. 71 yards, it's 20 to 6 at the half, so there is some momentum in Taylor Powell's first start. Speaking of Powell, a while later in this game, he's able to actually get a good rushing touchdown to keep things close. At his, it is 23 to 15. Tavares Daniels though makes Hamilton secondary look bad and led to Chad Kelly score not too long after to ice this game away for Toronto. Ultimately, I don't think Powell's start was a bad one by any means. I know it was a lot of swing routes to the outside, a lot of quick routes, you know, comebacks, slants, stuff like that in the middle, but. For a guy that, of course, is taking over the reins for a team in Hamilton that, you know, things had kind of gotten rocky with the quarterback health. I really liked what we saw here. As for Hamilton secondary, well, that was bad. As opposed to Winnipeg's receivers kind of finding the right spots to settle in coverage or if the play broke down where they're able to kind of get their feet set and then find that open spot. 
it was just Toronto's receivers absolutely burning them on vertical routes. This was embarrassing. And if you're Hamilton secondary, the next game you play, you got to be better as Toronto moves to 5-0. and Hamilton now 2-4 and on the year. Then for the third game, of course, you have the BC Lions hosting the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Talk would be about how well Mason Fine did replacing Trevor Harris. But talk also kind of shifted rather quickly as you would see Vernon Adams Jr. get hurt. Dane Evans would have to come in in to relieve him. Of course, Dane is a guy that has a ton of experience despite being a backup quarterback. Probably could be a starter in some markets. Uh, but yeah, goes in there. Everybody's worried about Vernon Adams Jr. Vern seems to be okay, but at the time he would miss this game. Dane does his thing on this drive though with two good throws to Keon Hatcher and Alexander Hollins. Nice, easy touchdown as well to Hollins, if I'm not mistaken. The Riders try to get creative on a punt. Doesn't look great. Balls fumbled. Ends up, you know, okay because they recover it. They end up coming away with three there, and it's 7-3 BC at the half. Then in the third quarter, you would see Dane Evans throw an interception. He even said it was a bad throw on his part to Mari Henderson, and Saskatchewan would capitalize off that, getting a field goal. So it's 7-6. to six. A little while later, though, you see BC get a couple of field goals of their own, one happening after a Shivers touchdown was called off, unfortunately. But it's 13-6. to six. They have the lead. The Riders have the ball, and they are kind of like midfield territory looking to drive, tie this one up. That's when Gary Peters decides to get an interception, and a little while later, we would see the Riders head coach, Greg Dickinson, kind of make a weird decision here to go for it on third down instead of going for a field goal. Um, and then basically he gets it. And then a little bit later on, he ends up kicking the field goal when he could have either just got the field goal earlier or not killed time. I think he made a few weird decisions in this one. They go for an onside kick, and if I'm not mistaken, BC recovers it, kicks the field goal. It's 19-9. Saskatchewan tries to drive again. Matthew Betts ends up getting the sack on the last play of the game. That is his 10th on the season, the most in the season by a Canadian player is 17. He's done so in what now, 6 or 7 games, which is incredible. The Riders just couldn't score off turnovers and couldn't establish the run to save their lives as Jamal Morrow ends up finishing with 11 carries for 12 yards. So basically 1 yard per carry. Big day for the Wines. Obviously not pretty. But the good news is Vernon Adams Jr. is fine. They keep their lead in the West. And Dane Evans played pretty well in this one. I know that Henderson interception wasn't great, but it wasn't awful. Then the final game of the week, we saw the Ottawa Red Bikes travel to Calgary. And this one was a big one for both sides. Dustin Crum looking to get another overtime win, or just a win in general. And Calgary, of course, looking to gain some ground on the Rough Riders. And they end up seeing the Red Bikes take the lead with a field goal. Calgary responded with a touchdown of their own. But Brandon Dandridge decided, hey, I did this last week. I got a pick six against Winnipeg. They really give us a jolt. I'm going to do so again here against Calgary to get a 10-6 lead after the first quarter a fumble on a handoff by calgary whoever you want to sign blame to mayor and i can't remember who the running back was whatever the case is there i don't think mayor was the problem there might be wrong anyway leads to an ulti milotovic lead to a touchdown as the red blacks are up 17 to 6 a little back and forth between both sides in the second quarter here and it is ottawa who is up 20 to 19 at the half but jake mayor for his credit was hitting the deep ball something we saw this week in the week prior still down one point after 30 minutes of play in the third it's calgary's defense it forces a good punt tommy lee lewis has a big return lewis is or yeah tommy lee lewis has been looking pretty good there in the return game i don't remember how many weeks he's been doing now but at least the past two for sure um and it was good there fourth overall pick cole tucker leads the eventual drive for stevens tommy stevens ends up getting the touchdown but tucker had a good catch on that one and i think for tucker he is the fourth overall pick or fifth overall pick from this past season for Calgary so this was good for them and then a little while later after Calgary took the lead we saw the Ottawa Red Blacks end up getting a stop turnover on downs Ottawa gets in Gould field position to score a touchdown in a two-point conversion as they are now up 28-25 I guess it doesn't matter though because Mark and Michelle ends up embarrassing Ottawa's defense here. He had a huge touchdown. I don't remember how many yards it was. It was a long yard touchdown. Um, it was something like 80, 90 yards, something like that. And with this, the Stampeders hold a 32 to 28 lead with about five minutes left to play in the fourth. They're looking to drive in this one. Jake Mayer throws a ball, gets tipped up and intercepted. Unfortunately for him in Ottawa, scores on the ensuing drive. 
Rennie Paredes ends up saving the day again and forcing overtime. But you know what? After a little back and forth and Ottawa scoring to end this one, it is the Red Bikes end up winning 43 to 41 in overtime. You get to see one of the better games of the year. Dustin Crumb back to back OTWs for Ottawa. They moved to 3 and 3 and are now second in the East, which would lock them up into a playoff spot for the first time since 2018. And everything is all great there. As for the Stampeders, this is a painful loss. They moved to 2 and 4 on the year, but I will say, Jake Mayer, the past two leagues, has looked pretty good 450 yards in this one. Obviously, he had some big throws. Yes, I think he had two interceptions on the day. The pick six isn't a great look. They had a fumble that again led to points. But the other interception that would have really allowed them had they scored off that drive to get the win, I don't think was the end-all be-all. But for Calgary, they're looking to get some answers because Coach D basically said, if things don't change, some guys are not going to be playing to, getting playing time. We're getting out of here. But anyway, what are your thoughts for this week in the CFL Week 7 action? I'd love to hear your comments down below. Also, please make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new. Everybody stay safe and have a great night.